There we go. And welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube now as well. On the TCF side of things, we want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring our webinars. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. So contact me for more information if you know of a company that might be interested in sponsoring some of our webinars. And you can also help us to keep these webinars free. At the end of this, when you close out of this webinar, you're going to be taken to a page with a bunch of resources from the Conservation Foundation um, of things you might be interested in, like our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help TCF continue to do all of the awesome stuff that we do, because we do so much more than just webinars. You can also check the box to become a member, and then you can find out um, all of the members only stuff. So we've got a tree and shrub sale coming up. We're going to have a plant sale in the spring. We've done um, hikes that were members only, all kinds of great reasons to become a member. Plus, you're supporting the Conservation Foundation. And I just wanted to point out today is the start of the Take a Hike initiative. You can join the Conservation Foundation, Edward Elmhurst Hospital, and more. Um, register online. You take six hikes or walks over the next eight weeks, and then you can get your Trailblaze Award, a really cool medallion and a walking stick. They're super nice looking, and I'm very excited. I have signed up, and my dog Ace is looking forward to doing these hikes with me this fall as well. Um, all right, this is usually where I would talk about upcoming webinars. I don't have a speaker locked in for our October webinar, so watch this space. Uh, keep an eye on Facebook. We will have more information coming. So um, we'll get that. It, hopefully it's supposed to be on climate change. So we will get somebody to talk with us about climate change in October. All right. Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to my friends, Jan and Nancy, also from the Conservation Foundation. And we're going to hear all about how they work to refresh our gardens around our, uh, our offices this summer. So take it away, ladies. Okay, thank you, Jamie. So hopefully, let's see, there we go. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, as Nance, uh, Jamie said, um, Jan Rail and Nancy join me. And for those of you um, who may not know, on March 31st, early this spring, we started the whole garden refresh update. We redid all the gardens at our office. But before we get into that, I'm going to have Nancy start by telling you a little bit about the Conservation Foundation. Welcome, everybody. Um, so the con in case you're new to our webinars, we wanted to start with some basic information about our organization. Um, we've been around since 1972, so that's almost 50 years, and we're a 503c3 uh, nonprofit. And our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space, protecting rivers and watersheds and promoting stewardship of our environment. Next. We do a lot of things, uh, including land preservation and restoration. We've worked with forest preserve districts and park districts to do that, um, as well as with individuals. We have, I think, five staff working um, with groups to clean and restore rivers and streams. We do environmental education for children. Um, before the pandemic, I think we had worked, it, we worked with more than a thousand school children um, during that year. And we're happy to say that um, we are accredited now by the Land Trust Accreditation Commission. And that was awarded to the Conservation Foundation for meeting the highest national standards for excellence in conservation permanence. And Jan was responsible for pulling together all that documentation, which the rest of the staff was really happy about. <laughs> Next. Uh, we primarily work in DuPage, King, Pendle, and Will counties in Illinois, and then as needed, um, you know, assist um, uh, in DeKalb, LaSalle, and Grundy counties. Some of these other areas don't have forest preserve districts or park districts, and so uh, we assist as we, as we can uh, when we're asked to. Our headquarters is in uh, South Naper on McDonald Farm, which is an um, organic uh, vegetable farm. For those of you who, uh, just a note for those of you who are not in North 
Eastern Illinois or the Midwest. Um, I mean, a lot of what we talked about will be applicable to any garden, but uh, the specific plants you would need to check in your area to see what, um, what variety would be the best fit for your area. Because um, we're just talking about plants in the Midwest right now for this. Next. Ready? Um, to date, we've uh, preserved over 35,000 acres, um, which includes 45 conservation easements on private property. And um, as I mentioned, worked in a number of counties. Next. Yep. So we are enthused about our work because it's important to preserve open space in order to um, improve our quality of life. So open space along rivers and streams protects water quality um, and the habitat within the stream. Open space, which with all the trees and such, improves our air quality. Um, we think it's important to pre preserve wildlife habitat so we don't lose the plants and the animals that have lived here for thousands of years. And then open space and forest preserves and such, um, you know, provides a place for people to enjoy the outdoors. And we certainly saw a lot of interest in that in the last year or so. And in addition, we feel a responsibility to future generations to, to um, protect open spaces, not, not see them be developed and disappear forever. In Illinois, we've already lost most of our prairie it was the prairie state and most of it's gone. I don't remember the exact number, but it's a small fraction that's left, the original prairie. Next. I'm trying and I'm having technical difficulties. Oh, it's and it's not advancing. Okay, so let me try. You know what? Let me get out of this. I'm gonna stop share for a second. For some reason, I'm having technical difficulty, okay. and I'll try it again. Ah, let's go back to that. Air, and it still doesn't want to do it. Stop uh, share. Let me try this again. I don't know why it worked fine just a few minutes ago. Let me figure out. Let's see. I'll screen share again. Let's. Yeah, I was yep. going to say, can, can you go to the slide that you're looking for and then start your presentation from there? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Let me go to that, do that share and move down and redo it. But we're ready to move on anyway, right? Yes. So let me yes. do there from current slide. Let's try it. And it's going back to that one. Okay. Well, we can go to, we can go to the other one. And let me go to, um, let me do this. I am going to shut down the one I was using there now i'm going back to sorry about this folks screen share I'm having technical difficulty now. so here share let's see if this works this time there we go hopefully that's okay, everyone okay so so yes, at the Conservation Foundation, we really encourage people to choose native plants. And this picture helps illustrate why. This was obviously taken during um, a dry period, probably middle of July or something. And the plants on the, um, on the right, you can see are still all green, flowering, looking pretty, whereas the grass, the turf grass, which originally came from an area that was cooler and moister than the climate we have around here, is not doing so well in the drought. Um, so that is one illustration of why native plants are good. Um, there are other reasons, of course, like their interactions with the insects and such. Next, hopefully. Stuck? It's stuck again. Ah, oh, I don't know why it's doing this. Let's stop share again. I want to try, I don't know why it's doing this tonight. And I even, uh, downloaded it from our teams to make sure that this wouldn't happen. And it's still doing it. Let's try this again. Go to the next slide. I hate to do it like this. On current slide. Escape. Sorry, folks. Uh, let's see. It's Share. the gremlins in the computer. It is. 
share. And then I'll go to this from current slide. Oh, I just, Oops. there we go. Hey, it worked. Good. So another reason we encourage the native plants is because the prairie plants have very deep roots, as you can see in this picture. Um, some of them will grow farther down into the soil than a um, person is tall. You can see the small illustration of the person standing by the tree. The compass plant, for example, can grow roots down 14 feet. So when it's dry, these plants can just keep growing their roots farther down um, once they're established and get the soil down farther into the, uh, or get moisture from farther down into the soil. So these are very hardy plants and can uh, withstand the droughts that we periodically get. Next. I don't know what is going on with this tonight. I've never had issues before I did a presentation today. And it's not wanting to work for me again. I don't know if you want to take over, Jamie, but uh well, maybe if um just don't start the slideshow. Just show the show it from PowerPoint. Okay, let me try another thing here. Let me try something else. Uh I'm gonna try it from our teams. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm trying to get down. I don't know if that's causing a problem. Let me get out of this. Do you have Teams yeah. open or did you? I wonder if that's caused a problem. I download, let me see, here we go. Okay, here we go. Let's try this now, it seems to be working. Can you see it? Um, you see? I see the PowerPoint, but not oh, like- You're, the you're lagging there. suddenly. There. Okay, let me try it again. This is very frustrating. Sorry about this. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So other benefits of native plants are that they can filter and absorb water. Um, good for runoff, taking care of runoff. They uh, can break up clay soil. They're particular plants that are very good at, at um, you know, thrive in clay soil, which is very helpful, especially in the Midwest where we have a lot of heavy clay in our soils. They feed the light wildlife, as I um, referenced. They tend to be long lived, and um, you know, the more garden you have, the less uh, you have to spend time. The less cost in terms of time and money for um, mowing grass, which needs a lot of care for it to look good. And then the prairie plants, with their deep roots, improve the soil, and that's why we have the, the great soil that we have in the Midwest for for farming develop under the prairie soils. Next. Okay. We are having the same issue. We might have to just go back to the this is try good. pressing down or right arrow on keyboard. I did, I did both. Ah. I thought I Thanks should have a suggestion though. Yeah. What's odd is Teams is showing up and I took it off of Teams, let me see. And I don't wanna to have to do it this way as far as, should be the next slide. You might need to though. There, it's working again. Okay. And of course, there are a lot of beautiful um, plants, you know, native plants. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is unlike the annuals that we might buy at a, a nursery, they're not going to bloom throughout the season, but that's okay because you can plan that in your garden and have a, um, a succession of plants um, blooming during, throughout spring, summer, and fall. And our eye will naturally go to whatever's blooming. And so you don't have to have everything in bloom at the same time. Hey, you work. Hey. And just a reminder how important plants are that the energy from the sun flows um, through our ecosystems, through the plants. Uh, the plants turn the energy from the sun into, um, into something that's nutritious, that uh, animals and insects eat, and other animals eat them, and um, even provide nutrients for the 
what we call the decomposers, the things that live, fungus, bacteria, and other organisms that live in the soil and break down the, um, the dead plants and such. So plants are critical to our ecosystems and climate actually. And you know, we believe you need to landscape as if life depended upon it and not just uh, consider that it should be in your forest preserves, but that there are things that you can do right on your property to bring um, habitat and ecological processes right into our neighborhoods. Hey, so Ray, Dan you... is going to um, talk about the next, sec next section of slides. Here. Our fingers crossed that it keeps moving along. Seems to be a lag time too. But anyway, this is um, our office is located in Naperville, uh, Illinois. And if you're ever in this area, it's all fully developed except for this 60 acre farm. And this is the Clow House. So the gardens that we redid are, is um, this is what it looked like last summer. And um, and it advanced this time by, by itself. The gardens we redid is, where's my, there's my area. This area here, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, mm -hmm. all along the front here, the right side, and on the side, it's a shady bed that we redid also. And so this is last year. This is some uh, black-eyed Susans and some butterfly weed that was here. Uh, there was penstemon coming up, but we wanted to make it look a little more neater and formal using native plants. So this is how it looked this past winter uh, and early spring when we we're starting to prepare the beds. And this is just looking from the other angle from the front door, looking back to that area here that I just showed. And this is a plan that uh, Nancy and I designed for the front. And what I'm gonna do, um, some of you may be new during our garden refresh originally, we went in detail over the plants. So if you wanna see more detail about the plants, you can look at that video um, in YouTube. But this one is just gonna be a general what the plants are. And I'm gonna start back in this area here and then go to the front here as I'm describing what plants we installed very quickly, just an overview. overview. Um, wild blue indigo is this area, these three, they have the almost shrub-like plants that go here in the corner, uh, and it's hyssop. And Nancy later on is going to discuss, uh, we substituted some plants because it was a real challenge getting some plants this year because uh, there's such a high demand. Um, and this is a close-up actually of the anise hyssop, uh, the, the bees actually love it. And I'm going to show a short video. This is in my yard. This is, uh, we planted this at the farm too. Uh, this is Calamantha nepeta, subspecies nepeta. And uh, these are all the bees that absolutely love it. And then this is the uh, anis hyssop that they just were everywhere. And I'm going to, you know, some people may not think they want bees in their yard, but actually it's what bothers you are the yellow jackets not the bees. I was back here, they never bothered me. I walked through. Um, as long as you don't aggravate them, you're, you're pretty good. Oops, it's still going. So this is a difference. If you look closely, I'm just gonna review briefly. Uh, this is a honeybee and this is a yellow jacket. And the yellow jacket is actually a wasp. Um, and they're very aggressive, especially this time of year as their food source goes away. They're also trying to get more carbohydrates um, for in sweets to store for the winter. And the bees go to the flowers for the dust and the next nectar and usually avoid people. Whereas yellow jackets, they like to sting and they're very aggressive and they can sting multiple times. Whereas the honeybee, they sting you once and they're dead. Um, so, and I have experience with yellow jackets and bees and I can tell you, um, I got stung by a bumblebee that I did just slightly. I, I actually bent over into it. So it's my fault that one of my neck, but it didn't give, but I had a bad reaction to yellow jackets, which is a wasp. So there is a big difference in, you know, the yellow jackets are actually search for meat, sweet fluids, candy. Those are the ones that you see at your picnic tables bugging you all, all summer late in late fall, um, not the honeybee. So honeybees really don't bother you. I have them right in the back of my yard behind a couch we have there and they never bother us when they're around. So, uh, so this is the plant I just showed you with the bees on it, the Calamantha nepeta or lesser calamint. Here's a close up of the flower. And in our planting bed, it's this area right here in the garden, uh, prairie drop seed. And it's a beautiful, right now the seed heads come up and they smell like buttered popcorn. And again, this is a uh, millennium allium that comes up in between the prairie drop seed. And we have some Coreopsis golden shower. And on the plant, there are these shrubs right here, there's, there's small perennials right here. And then the butterfly weed, I love this. The butterfly, it's a beautiful milkweed plant. And the plant, we have it in this area here and in the center here, we'll have it. And then this is a spring ephemeral shooting star. 
And those the areas right here, these little clusters that will come all along the front, um, they die back in the summer. So there's no vegetation. You can't even see them in our gardens. And they come up in, before the uh, prairie dropsy come out, which is a warm season grass. And these are the uh, uh, purple cone flowers. They're beautiful flowers. And there's, these are clusters here that we have in the planting plan. And I like to repeat the elements that are in the plan. And then we did have difficulty getting purple, purple poppy mallow or wine cup. And those would be planted, they're more of a vine-like foliage and they'd be planted to the purple ones here that would be planted in between. We weren't able to get them this year. We're hoping to get them next year. Um, and then this is a New Jersey tree shrub. Uh, it's a small shrub that will be going back here as a, like a hedgerow or accent behind the plants as a green backdrop. And then this is a, a pussy toes. They're gonna to go, it's a low growing sort of ground cover and it's gonna go in front of this memorial rock that we have here. And to soften the look of the rock behind it, we have some uh, uh, Cariax Pennsylvanica, the, uh, it's a sedge that goes up behind it. And now, um, and then this is a phlox. This is back in the corner, there it is. And it's back here in the corner. And these are actually butterflies from my yard this past year. I have flocks in it and they just love it. I have butterflies over it. These are two swallowtails that I have over it all season. So this is the overview of what the garden looked like, uh, the plan of it. And now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to the right side over here. Sam? Oh, oh sorry, yes. I just want to inter interject something uh, about the flocks. So that's yes. a common garden flocks, um, not a native, but it's been developed. It's a cultivar developed from the native and it still functions um, just as well in terms of attracting pollinators. Okay, thank you, Nancy. And I'm going to, so this is, um, I'll be going to the right side, but this is what the garden looks like uh, after it was planted. Uh, this is, it's hard to see it back here is the uh, indigo. These will be shrub-like, they get very tall. Uh, this is the prairie dropsy that's gonna go along the entire front. This is a hedge of New Jersey tea, the phlox is back here. Uh, this is the purple cone flower in between. This is the uh, butterfly weed, which is also over here. And this is a little bit of the um, Coreopsis. And I'm going to, so this is a, this is a little closer up. Um, this is, this is, I just took this uh, two days ago. So this is dying, you know, the flowers have gone back a little bit. Uh, this is the butterfly weed. That's uh it's actually dying back now too, but it's there. There's some of the butterfly weed in close up, close corner there. This is a purple cone flower. Um, it's, it really established well. We planted gallon pots, so that's why they're so well established at this time instead of using plugs. And this is looking back from the doorway, looking back, the purple cone flower I just showed you is over here. And we're gonna keep following this. This is what New Jersey tea looks like now. It's gonna be the shrub, but this is what they look like right now after we planted them. And now I'm moving to the right side. The area I just showed you is over here. Now I'm showing you this area over here. Um, this is what it looked like before. We had some ugly yuccas in there that didn't look so well. Um, and other plants that we didn't plan on. So this is the plan for it. There's a little path along here, a stone path. Again, I repeated the same, we both repeated the same elements. This is the uh, prairie drop seed, the shooting star, uh, the purple cone flower. Um, this is a uh, cultivar. Uh, uh, Cynthia Carpus uh, Sophie, it's a proud berry, coral berry. And then this is um, also a uh, cultivar that we put in. It's a, a purple dome uh, aster, so we have some fall color. So I'm just going to show you the plants that were new. This is the purple aster, and Nancy will describe a little more about it later on. And this is the proud uh, berry, coral berry. It gets this white flower in the spring, but what it's known for is it's a uh, pink berry later in the fall. So this is what it looks like planted right now. This is again, this is the prey drop seed. And if this is, we left these markers in so we know where the uh, shooting star will come up. But as you can see, they've died back to you know, ground level. You don't see them. This is the uh, purple dome mum. That's our asters, I'm sorry, that are in here. And these are the purple cone flower with one here. And that's the uh, proud berry right there. So go, moving on, this is now the two sides I've shown you get full Western sun, Western and Southern sun. So it's very bright. Uh, this plant here is the shade garden. It's on the east side of the, uh, the, the plow house. It's a lot of shade and it's very dry because it's a hillside. So this is what it looked like when we started and all these rocks here, I'll show a picture later. Um, we removed a lot of these rocks in this area because we want to put a bench and more planting and 
we found out as we were digging that a lot of these rocks came from underground. So it was a really difficult dig planting some of these. Um, these are some volunteer uh, white snake root that came in. Um, and, you know, they were there when we started. And I just want to talk about, you know, sometimes you want to hide some um, unsightly issues you may have, like some of the utilities here. Um, these are some pipes that are coming out of the side of the house for venting and also hooked up to the cistern. And we wanted to, and the gas meter, so we wanted to hide some of that. And that's what the shrubs will be for. So in the plan, we start off, this is um, the uh, oak leaf hydrangea. It's a uh, ruby slipper. We could not get the uh, uh, oak leaf hydrangea we wanted. So this is a cultivar and it will get big right now. They look really small. And in the plan, uh, those areas I showed you that need screening was here where the meter is and over here where the pipes were. So these shrubs go in this area. So eventually they're going to get tall enough and they do send out, um, I want to say like runners or something. Yeah, they do spread. So they will connect. They have ground, they'll connect with each other. Um, this is a service berry, the autumn brilliance. Uh, we found that the deer really like them. We found out uh, there is one here, here, and here. We couldn't get them in five gallon pots. So we purchased bald and burlap ones, which I'll talk about later. Um, when we go to plant. And uh, this is a beautiful, uh, this is a great suggestion that uh, Nancy liked. It, was, it looks like it's an adoratum flower, like that blue annual that you see, but this is a perennial. Um, it's a blue, it's a mist flower, and it's absolutely beautiful. And I have a picture of it there. I was out here and there were monarchs all over it. And this is, you know, gets a lot of shade in this area. It's all the way in the back of the garden. It's, it's sort of dry and it's along the hillside there. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful flower. I really like it. Um, this is a zigzag plant. Again, this is a shady, shade loving plant. And we have it in this area here, here. We, we put some back here because when we originally did the plan, it actually came in more and we found out that our bed was a little bit bigger. So we had to expand it a little bit. Um, and this lady fern, we had difficulty getting lady fern. We still hope to get those in uh, next year, but we have some lady, fern, or lady ferns here, here. These are native ferns to this area in Illinois where we are. Um, and this is Solomon seal. They have these little fruit that are flowers that hang down. They get berries in the fall. And they're in this area here. We actually transplant them. They were actually growing up in this area. We moved them down to here. We're hoping they come back. They, this drought has been killing us here, trying to keep everything watered. And they sort of died back, but we're hoping they'll come back. Yeah, very dry year here for us. Yeah, for Especially those of you in the spring. Yes. Um, and this is the big leaf aster. Um, it's actually blooming. We have a plant blooming right now. I don't know if I got a picture of it, but it's a really nice plant. Um, we have it here in this area here and over here in this uh, in the plan. And then uh, the gera wild geranium. This is a great uh, plant that likes shade and can tolerate a little sun with it. So we have it along the edge so that um, right down here in this area and we have some up in here. So this is going to get some sun in the morning. And it's fine, it tolerates sun. It's a great massing uh, ground cover. This is an example of what it looks in the woodland. To give you an idea of the habitat, it does tolerate shade. This is a large expanse in one of the uh, messenger woods here by Illinois. And then this is a, a long beak sedge. This is actually, just, again, to soften the rocks. This is back here uh, along the edge. It does tolerate some dry areas. Uh, and this is a wild columbine. And this is the little red clusters here and they send up little seed heads in the fall. Um, we haven't had an issue at the farm as far as rabbits, but at my house, the rabbits have eaten them to the ground. So I just, it, I don't know why they just don't bother me here, but we've had, I've had issues at home trying to keep them, the rabbits from eating it all. Um, Jack in the pulpit. Uh, these come up in the spring. These are little, I have them in the plan here in this area and here. And these come up in the spring. It's a spring ephemeral again, that's gonna come up and then it's gonna die back to the ground in the, in the, in the summertime when the, you know, the heat kicks in. And wild ginger, I love this as a ground cover. Um, we transplanted it on our, it was on the upper area here by the building. We transplanted it down here, it's along the edge and we have some up in this area and it's taken off pretty well um, from the transplanting, but it is uh, a great ground cover plant if you have shady areas. Um, may apples, I love may apples. They uh, look like little Lilliputian little, uh, it looks like umbrellas to me. Uh, we have some in this area here and uh, they come up again. Mine's still up. It's a spring ephemeral. It comes up in the spring. Mine just now are starting to, to die back to the ground, but they're, they're there. So this is what the plan looks like. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, um, and I'm going to show you some of the plan later. Uh, when you go to design your garden, plan for three to four seasons of interest. So 
what that means is, as I mentioned, we have spring ephemerals, which come up in the spring. We have uh, some summer blooming flowers. In the fall, you want some asters in there also. So you have all the seasons and it provides food that entire season for the, you know, the birds and the monarchs, especially late fall when the monarchs need that food supply to fly to Mexico. It's really important to have uh, some fall blooming flowers for that reason. And as I said, plant for pollinators and birds. And you, know, you want plants that they can actually eat, be food, a yard that's working. Um, and choose plants that grow in the space they're meant for. Uh, I find that a lot of people plant them really close together and give them space to grow. Um, our, um, our hydrangea are very far apart, but they're going to grow big. You know, I know they're going to expand. So, um, and also plant to hide or screen the areas. And, um, and also when you go to plant, use the botanical name. And the reason I say this, when Nancy and I were actually working on this plant together, we both picked out their purple poppy mallow. And she goes, well, I want this plant, which is a wine cup. And we realized it's just, we were just talking common names and we were talking about the same plant. She knew it by one name and I knew it by another. So that's why it's sometimes, it's really important to identify a botanical name because you could be talking about the same plant, but it's, talk, it's spoken, it means two different things like service berry, the tree is also called June berry. So, you know, they have different names. And uh, so preparing your bed for uh, planting, so over the, uh, um, we, well, we actually put the cardboard down in uh, early spring. And I highly recommend that you get the cardboard down like in winter time and uh, top with mulch or something to keep it anchored down. And uh, if it's a really a small area, you can actually dig out the grass, but um, you know, you try, try not to use herbicide. We try, you know, we didn't hear, but we found that it didn't really kill the grass. So we actually stripped all the sod off the area. Um, if the plants don't fit in your design, you can move them, reuse them, donate it to a friend. And another hint is when you, before you, when you get your pots in, water the plants, uh, like if you're going to try and get them the day before and water them well, but if you get them that day, make sure they're well watered because when you go to plant them, if the ground is dried, especially at our office, it was really dry, it just sucked the water right out of them and you really need to keep them well watered. It also helps contain the the root, the pot, you don't want them soaking, but you want them damp, pretty well uh, dampened. Um, so we, it, well, we laid the bed, we wrote, laid it off with a hose, and I'll show you a picture of that, and we edged it with a spade, um, and we laid the pots out in where we wanted them to dig the holes. And part of that was because we had volunteers coming too, and we wanted to lay the plants out where they should go. And as I said, space them appropriately for what they're going to reach at full size. When it says they grow two to three feet, put them two to three feet apart, or 18 inches, 24 inches apart. And think about overhang too. The prairie drop seed, we kept 18 inches off the sidewalk. So we know it's gonna overhang. We don't want it hanging way over the sidewalk. And uh, also when you go to plants, now I did my front yard uh, last spring. I wish I had pictures. Uh, my son was laughing because we killed all the grass in the front yard and I was transplanting ferns and other plants to the front yard and the grass was still there. It was sort of, you know, it's dying. It was dead, but we were planting, it was dying back, it was like a light green. And I put the plants in the grass. And my son's go, so tell me, we're getting really funny looks because you have plants in the middle of our lawn everywhere. Um, but it, you know, eventually we just planted through it and we mulched over the top and you know, we let the grass go because it was killed enough. Um, you got to watch it, but make sure it's dead. Um, and we don't recommend rototilling just because if you do that, all that exposed dirt is going to allow weed seeds to come in. Uh, we found that out. We started stripping off the, uh, we, I'll talk about the, the, the yes. filter fabric, and a bunch of weeds came in. But between the time we pulled that back and started planting. So I have some pictures here. So this is how we started last, this early spring. Nancy and I were out, and we had uh, laid a hose down to lay out the bed. So we had wrapped the hose all around this area, and we came back with a spray can and spray painted it. So we knew where we wanted to edge the bed. And I said, Try not to do it on a windy day. We had a heck of a time with the wind taking the, the cardboard. So that's why this is anchored down with rocks. Every so often, even with these rocks on it, the, they, the things that get picked up and blown away. Um, and actually what we found is we have voles on the property and the voles did a great job of killing a lot of grass under there for us. <laughs> so then we tarped it and we discovered what was interesting is when we pulled this up, the grass under the cardboard with more dead, this was hardly even looked like it was even touched. The light came through the tarp. And maybe you get a different result with black 
tarp, but don't use a blue tarp, we found. So the do's and don'ts, don't use a blue tarp, it doesn't work. Um, and a friend of ours that puts it down, if you still get newspapers, he actually puts newspapers down with mulch on top. And then he just turns, the, he just, when he goes to plan, he just turns the newspaper right in with the soil because it decomposes. Um, so this is all of it laid out. And we actually come, sometimes had to come back because they would actually start blowing away even with the rocks on it. So filter fabric. Um, Nancy and I really do not like filter fabric uh, and using it, but certain members of our staff do like using it. So it's everywhere uh, where we planted. We had another area, there was like five layers of this filter fabric. And what I'm trying to show is even though you put filter fabric down, the roots come through. Um, this is Jennifer in our office trying to help us peel it back. We started peeling it back and you can see we peeled it back. And this is this whole area here where this bed was, was all filter fabric. And, and as you go to pull it, you know, all the dirt comes with it and you had to keep cutting it away. It was a struggle. So I'm showing you, this is um, the roots. This is, this is filter fabric, but these are the roots coming right through it. So yes, it does make it easier to weed, but the, they can still go through the filter fabric. The other thing we found, oops, it advanced only by itself. The other thing that Nancy and I noticed when we did this is the ground that was under the filter fabric was really compacted and really dry. I mean, it was, you know, yes, some water did, does, but we just found that there was like no organic matter in it. Very few worms. You didn't find all the typical healthy soil conditions there because this, I believe the filter fabric really blocked it out. Um, so as I mentioned, the rocks, this is Jason and Augustine on our farm. They were great helpers. Uh, it does pay to have a tractor um, because of our farm, but they helped us load these rocks and they hauled them away for us. And these are, this is one load of boulders. We had like three load of these boulders. And we actually have a boulder pile at the office that we take all the boulders to. Um, something we recommended too. So as I said, we had pulled up some of the filter fabric in here and you can see all these weeds started coming back up. So we actually dampened the ground so that we knew we were gonna be weeding next day. And it made it so much easier to pull some of the, you don't want it soaking so that you compact it, but you do want to make it easier to pull some of the weeds. And as I mentioned before, make sure you water the pots before you plant them and water regularly. So even though they're natives and we say, oh, they're not much maintenance, you do need to water them regularly. And Nancy will uh, go over that later, regularly when you first put them in. Um, and, but you don't want it overwatered um, because it, you usually let them dry out in between watering. Overwatering looks similar to not enough water, they really wilt and it actually can, it'll kill the plant. Um, so this is when we started, this is all the, the one gallon pots that were delivered and the pint size and either all the plants uh, lined up when they were delivered. This is our volunteer crew and the, the pile of mulch that was out there to, to plant the plants. And so as I mentioned, this is different size pots. This is the one gallon pots and it really helps the plant get established quickly. You can buy plants in plugs um, but we wanted to have a more instant effect and get this kicked off the ground. Uh, these are some wild geranium and the pint size. And the reason we got the pint size is we just couldn't get the gallon for these, uh, the size, the number we wanted. And so this is some uh, wild columbine we just had put in. So the bald burlap, we had to get, as I, these are our sort of sad looking uh, service bear because the deer really like them. Uh, they ate a lot of twigs off and a lot of leaves. And the, we had this temporary mulch just to keep it uh, wet and moistened, but this is what, you know, this is the bald and burlap tree that came. We had to get a tree cart. So one thing, if you're, if you're planting uh, a bald and burlap shrub, it is heavy. I mean, really heavy. It took two to three of us to maneuver this heavy plant ball and it had a cage on it. So you have to cut the cage away on this area and peel back the burlap. And, you know, there's, uh, some people say it can grow through it. Some say it can't. So we made sure that the root, uh, the root ball was pulled, the, I'm sorry, the burlap was pulled back. Uh, so the top of the plant exposed uh, as we went to plant it and let it just decompose, pull it down, let it decompose in those things. But you have to dig a really big hole to get this into. It's heavy, um, but this was the only option we had to get these plants. They didn't, as I said, they didn't have them in a five gallon container or a seven gallon. And um, when we went to dig, we actually had to use pickaxes and we hit huge, huge boulders. And some of it, as one of the plants is sort of sitting high because we took all day to get these in. It's like, okay, we're done. Uh, we just couldn't get any further because the bottom of the hole had so much stone and rock in it. It was a real challenge. 
And if I remember correctly, yeah. we even moved the position a little bit from where we were going to put yeah, them. We did. Uh, we just did. because it was Wait, a the boulder was in the way. <laughs> yeah, the hole was, the boulder took up half the hole, so we had shifted down further than we anticipated, just because it's the way it was. So, um, do we want to answer any questions at this time? Are there any questions that we yeah. can answer? Okay. Yeah, there, there was one. Um, so Taylor wants to know how did you get rid of the yucca? <laughs> so we actually, you know, we, we got really lucky. We dug ours out and it has not come back. And I don't know why. And I, from experience, there's a uh, farmstead, this pool I did a design for, and there is yucca that uh, we dug out and it's come back. Uh, we dug it out again. It came back. A woman said she tried to, she said, I know it's not good for the soil, but she did put bleach on it, trying to avoid Roundup. And it came back and we put Roundup on it and it came back. It is just an aggressive plant that I, we got lucky. Ours, they dug out, it was one big mass. Well, we, other, yeah, ahead. actually, do you, you remember, we have a volunteer who yes. works here regularly and he put a rope around the base of it and attached it to the gator and pulled and it just pulled a big hunk of rooks out. So that was very effective. Um, so I don't know if that helped that it was, the, he did it that way. And got the entire plant. I mean, like the one by us, the roots are still in there. So they still keep coming up. It's a very persistent, uh, persnickety plant. Yeah, but we haven't seen any signs of it. No, we haven't signed, seen signs of it, thank, knock on wood, so far. It's probably one of those things that as long as you get all the roots. Roots, yeah. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. Um, Louise wants to know if you have any planting plans that you can share or, or different ideas on where people could get suggestions maybe for making their own plans. So uh, we can definitely send out uh, to the, I did last time for the garden refresh, I sent out the plans, I've uh, scanned plans, and I can send that out with the plant list that we used to everyone. Uh, I did that last time too, so we can do that again. And as far as plans, uh, Wasn't Jamie, there a we website you shared? I don't remember, I, we, we shared our brochure though. You know our brochure that we have, the, that yellow one, mm -hmm. how to plan that, it had some plans in that. I don't remember, a, I can't remember if I shared a website. It's been a while. I could go back. I could actually go back and look at the email that I sent and resend that and with the plans on it too. So I had mentioned to everybody that at the end of the webinar, when you close out, you'll be on that page with all that information. That okay. yellow brochure that's our big plant list Bible yes. that Nancy mentioned, there will be a link to that on that page. So everybody will have access to that at the end. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie. Any other questions? I think we can save the other two maybe for a little bit later. Okay, it's all yours, Nancy. Okay, so we get a lot of questions about, um, you know, is it okay to plant in the fall? And the answer is sure, um, especially the beginning of, of September in this area, we probably still have at least two more months of growing season. Um, and the plants, what the plants really wanna do when they're first put in the ground is to work on their roots. And while the air temperature gets cooler as the fall progresses, the soil stays warm for longer. So it works pretty well to plant things in the fall. I mean, obviously a lot of people wanna plant in the spring because that's when you're thinking about things growing. So spring is a good time. Both spring and fall tend to have more rain um, and people can also plant in the summer. It's just that we usually have um, you know, more, more drought, um, the rain tends to be in thunderstorms, which is hard. I and mean, a lot might come down, but a lot of it runs off because the ground's hard. So it's, uh, it takes a lot more watering to keep your um, plants thriving if you put them in when, when it's hot and dry. Um, trees and shrubs can be put in, you know, basically anytime the ground isn't frozen. Um, but they too do better um, in the spring and the fall. And um, as Jan talked about earlier, it's a little easier to grow them when they're in a container. Um, if you do have to get a bald and burlap one, you might wanna consider hiring someone to help you because they're very heavy and hard to manage. Um, in terms of container grown, I did wanna mention um, 
that if they stay too long in a container, if a tree has grown too long in a container, they can start circling the container and it ends up um, damaging the, uh, like girdling the, the, the tree. And in fact, I had some calls about this and um, recently about trees that were dying. They were quite old, maybe 20 years old or something like that. It looked like they had been growing fine and then were starting to die. And it had to do with the fact that when they had been planted, they had the, the roots had not been spread out properly and it continued to girdle the tree and eventually um, was killing it. So that's important to keep that in mind if you do get one grown in a container to make sure the roots are spread out when you plant them. Um, a lot of people want to put in a big tree so they have sort of instant you know, whatever their vision is for having a tree in their garden, um, they want that instantly. But we have found that smaller trees actually um, get acclimated faster and will grow, grow faster than you would expect. So, um, I mean, you probably want to put in one that's more than a foot high, but you know, a three foot tree may grow three feet. So you have a six foot tree the next season. Um, they really grow pretty quickly. Um, and then I mentioned um, planting, you know, avoiding planting during when it's hottest and driest. Um, if you do get herbaceous plants that are grown in a greenhouse, um, you, in the spring, you need to plant them after our last frost date because they haven't been hardened off properly. Um, most of the native plants that we get have been grown outside, so that's not a problem. But some of the plants we sell at our plant sale, we've requested to be grown for us. And so, um, we have to be careful about them. You know, we, when we're getting organized for the plant sale, we have all our plants sitting out on the lawn, um, but we have to take some things into the barn if we know it's going to be really cold until they're sold. You can usually tell those plants though because they're already big and blooming at the beginning of May, which normally they wouldn't be. It's pretty obvious. Next. I'm, gonna have I'm, I'm, again, I'm right? having issues again. Nancy, it seems, I don't know. It, it, I think it's me. <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> it was working. Uh, let's go back again. I can't believe this. It worked fine all this time. It seems like when I hesitate a long time, it, it doesn't want to go. Ah, that's <sighs> <I don't> know. <laughs> Let me try this again. I don't know why it's doing this. Okay. Okay. I'm going to turn share. I'm going, to, I'm going to scroll ahead to where you were down here. Sorry, folks. Just trying to get to where she was to see if that'll make a difference that I'm uh, starting where you are. Oh, the hole went too far. So you were right here. Some current slides. Try this. Oh, that's where we were. There we go. Hey, there. it worked. Yeah, just, in, uh, just a little bit more about watering. Um, the first year, even if you're using native plants, which eventually won't need much water, you need to water regularly if, you, if we haven't had much rain. Um, second year, you can water just as needed during the dry spells. And the third year, um, they really should, the plants, if they're sited appropriately, you know, right plant for the right space and, um, you know, water requirements and such, um, you should not need to water unless there's a severe drought or something. Um, and then we like to put a plug in for our rain barrels. Um, the plants love rainwater because uh, there are no chemicals in it. It keeps the rain from running off, off the land. Um, we're all about keeping water on the land and soaking in. And we do sell rain barrels. Uh, you can get them through our website and they're available year round. Next. So uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the choices, you know, we made that we had to think about when we were substituting plants. Jan mentioned that we couldn't get everything that we wanted to. 
Um, and some things are gonna have to wait till next spring, but we were looking for similar color, um, the same growing requirements for sun and moisture, similar height and width. And uh, we were thinking about, do we need to have a cultiv uh, native or would we be okay with the cultivar? And then of course, availability. Um, so it's always frustrating to decide exactly what you want and then go to the, um, go to the supplier and see we can't get it. <laughs> always an issue. So I'm gonna talk about um, some of the plants that we need to, to substitute. Uh, doing it again. I might just, I don't know what the issue is and why it's doing this tonight to us. I am going to get out of this one and see if that'll, ah, it's freezing on me. Let's try. While you're working on that, uh, Louise yes, yes. made an excellent point in the comments. She said she attended a landscape design talk and mm -hmm. they said that one nice tree in the front yard is on average a $7,000 added value to the house when you go to sell it. And I would definitely believe that. Everything that we've read and, and, and that we've heard says even things like adding trees along parkways, um, or you know, in in front of shops and stores, means people will linger longer, spend more money, and so even towns, it's it's worth them putting in additional um, trees, making sure that you know that they have nice landscaping mm -hmm. around businesses as well. Okay, we're going to try this again. Yeah, I can believe that, and also trees. Um properly placed, you know, if you put it on the south side, um, it can shade your house and then help you save on air conditioning costs considerably once it's grown up. We've never had this many problems. And now I can't get to, ah, I'm trying to, there we go, slideshow. Trying to get down to your picture here, Nancy. Sorry about this, folks. I've never had this much problems with it. And you're going to this one. Yeah, you do a lot of webinars. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think this was your next. Let me go back. Yep, that was your next slide. Yep. So initially, we were going to put in um, a cultivar called Star of Persia uh, because it has these huge flower heads that we thought would look good, you know, coming up between the prairie drop seed. Um, but not available, so we chose the Allium Millennium. And uh, it's similar color. It is more, a little bit more of a bigger clump, but that's okay. And it should grow to the same height. Uh, what we have, they're still a little bit short, but next growing season, I'm sure they'll get taller. Um, we had a very dry summer, even though we watered quite a bit. Um, plants were trying to get established. So uh, we, that, it'll still be pretty. Next. So we wanted to get the, um, the native anaspisa um, from our, the supplier we were gonna use for most of our plants, but um, we thought that they only had the blue fortune. So that's what we chose. But then at the, when the time came, that's what we chose to put in the plan. But when the time came to actually order it, they were out. So we went to another supplier and um, they did have the, the straight native. And you can see from the pictures um, that the native on the right is very similar to the plant on the left. So that actually worked out well. And as Jan mentioned earlier, the bees and such just love it. So that's been a good one. Okay, issues again. I don't know why it keeps doing this. I don't know, it's because if it, we did it on uh, Teams and I don't know if that's causing a problem with my sharing. I download it to my computer, but for some reason that could it is- be a problem with it, if you're doing it from your computer. Yeah, I download it from my computer and it's still giving me a grief here. So let's get down to the next one. Wow, there we go. So uh, we wanted to put some asters in for um, Jan mentioned about planting for all the seasons and the monarchs are heading south about now. Um, other butterflies and moths are still around. So we definitely wanted some asters for the fall. 
And uh, New England aster is such a pretty one, but the straight native uh, grows a little tall and can flop over if it doesn't have enough other plants around it. So we decided to go with the cultivar called Purple Dome. Um, it's still very popular for pollinators. And that's not an issue, but it has a nice round sort of tidy shape. And so we thought that would work better for our situation, particularly along the um, plow house on, to the right of the front door. It's a little bit narrow there, so it fit in, fit in better there. Shorts Aster is another one that uh, we were not able to get. Um, so we substituted the Big Leaf Aster. It used to be in the Aster family, but they've renamed it. Um, but still the common name is Big Leaf Aster. So we've been pretty happy with that. It's kind of a unique, um, a unique looking Aster, Aster in quotes. And then Jan talked a little bit before about the, uh, how we had to substitute the uh, ruby slippers for the straight species of the hydrangea um, quercifolia. Uh, it won't grow quite as tall, but it will be, it'll still be wide um, and, and fill in the space the way we needed it to. And, and the, it starts out blooming white, um, but then fades or then changes to pink. So we think that'll be very pretty along there. So just to say a little bit about mulching and composting. Uh, we definitely recommend mulching to keep the weeds under control. It helps to keep the soil moist. Um, we recommend that you use finely shredded hardwood mulch, but also, well, just a little bit more about that. Sometimes cities will provide mulch for free um, from trees that they've cut, limbs or whatever, but that's usually um, a very coarse, coarsely shredded mulch and takes too long to um, decompose. So we don't recommend that for a garden. Um, the um, leaves, we definitely recommend for mulching. You can shred them and, um, and spread them in flower beds. If you have maple trees, which have big leaves, they tend to mat down. So it is a good idea to shred them. Some oak leaves, for instance, curl up when they dry. So that's not necessary to shred them so much. I have a locust tree in my parkway and which produces a lot of small leaves. So I've just um, gathered them up and spread them in my flower beds. I'm going to talk about leaves a little bit more in a few slides. And then composting, of course, is good for your garden soil. Um, and healthy soils makes healthy plants. So, and composting helps keep the vegetable scraps out of the landfills. If you are going to do that, you need to mix your, your wet vegetable scraps with um, dry materials, kind of alternate them. If you're interested and want to know a little bit more about composting, we do have a webinar, uh, Composting 101 on our YouTube channel. And we sell composter bins along with the ring barrels. So we're here we are in fall and time to think about what you're going to do to get ready for um, put your garden to, to bed, so to speak. Uh, you may wanna remove dried stalks that look messy and mulch around the more tender plants. Um, if you happen to have roses, they usually you know, appreciate having a little bit more protection from the freeze and thaw around the base of the plant. And you would want to remove and dispose of, don't compost any leaves that are diseased. So um, yeah, I just wanna throw those into your, into your garbage. Next. But there are also a lot of reasons not to do much cleanup. So as I mentioned, you can leave leaves as mulch. Um, you can leave the flower heads for the birds to eat. Um, purple coneflower is a good illustration of that. They'll, they'll bring in the goldfinches eat the seed heads. A uh, number of insects overwinter in the, in the um, stems of, of plants. So if you, if you cut those and dispose of them, you are removing insects from your garden. One thing you can do if you don't like to leave the, the stalks, um, you can cut them at the base and just leave them lying on, your, on the bed until springtime when after it gets, starts getting warm and 
probably over say 55 degrees um, during the day, then the insects will have emerged and you can then rake up your the stems and compost them or put them out with the garbage, whatever you do in your area. Um, but the, if you leave the stalks and such, it, it does add winter interest. Um, so that's part of what you wanna be thinking about when you're designing your garden is winter interest. And to me, this is so appealing. It almost makes me want to a winter to come sooner rather than later. Almost makes me want that. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a bit about why leaf litter, leaving the leaves is important. Uh, it's important for plants because it helps hold in the moisture and reduce erosion and runoff. Um, it returns nutrients to the soil. If you think about it in the woods, nobody's raking up the leaves in the fall. They just fall and they don't build up. They disappear by the spring. Um, and then it improves organic matter in the soil. So the rain will soak in better and moisture will be retained for longer. Leaving the leaves is important for insects and others. I saw someone just posted that in the chat. Here's an illustration with the Isabella, uh, I, I think Isabella tiger moth is how is the proper name for the woolly bear caterpillar who uh, overwinters in, in leaves and then leaf litter, um, as well as the um, lightning bugs. Most of us remember chasing fireflies or lightning bugs um, when we were young. And it's, for me, it's been really sad to see how they've declined. Um, I have a, my garden is a bit wilder and uh, not heavily mulched. And so I get a lot of them uh, in the summer, which I really enjoy, but I look around at my neighbor's gardens, which are more traditionally landscaped and there are very few fireflies. So we can help the fireflies out by, by having more um, leaf mulch. And then there are a lot of critters that um, live in the soil like the centipedes and the millipedes that need the leaf litter. Um, a heavily mulched bed is not, not going to be as good a habitat for, for the things that live um, under the leaves in the, on the top of the soil like that. Next. And then it's important to leave the leaves for the birds because uh, there are a number of birds we know uh, who spend a lot of time on the ground looking for their food. So we know the robin does that. Um, it's adjusted very well to our suburban landscapes, um, but also things like the wood thrush, the brown thrasher, they hop along and they scratch in the leaves and they're, look, they're looking for the centipedes and the millipedes and the roly polies to eat. And also the eastern towhee is another bird that spends a lot of time on the ground, which would be really exciting to see. And it's amazing once one starts gardening a little differently, um, providing more habitat, these, these birds and things just show up. Who knows where they were hiding before, but then they are suddenly there. So it's fun to do that and see them. So after all this talk about getting native plants, um, here's some suggestions of where you can get them in our area anyway. Um, the Growing Place has a couple of locations, one in Naperville and one, I think the other one is Montgomery, but it's right on the edge of Naperville. We recommend the Possibility Place, um, which is doing online sales now. And we've ordered plants from them and they came looking very good, even though they came through the mail. Um, Wanamakers in Downers Grove. You can also ask your local nursery to order native plants for you. Um, they probably would have a minimum size order but uh, we would really encourage people, more and more people to do that because um, we would like to see the um, local gardening centers and such um, stocking more natives for people. We've seen a lot of interest in the last couple of years. Um, so we need more, more of these garden centers to stock them. There are a lot of native plant sales in our area, uh, spring and fall. We, we do a plant sale in the spring and then a tree and shrub sale in the fall. And we work with municipalities who also do tree and shrub sales. 
And Wild Ones is, um, has chapters all over the US and they often, in our area, they do uh, plant sales also. So I'm sure they are doing them in other areas. And forest preserve districts will have plant sales. So that's, especially in the spring, good place to, to get plants. And uh, just wanted to make sure that people knew to be aware that uh, we do not want to buy plants where the grower has used the neonicotinoids. Um, those are put on the plants to keep the insects from eating them and it kills the insects. So since we're trying to promote native insects, <laughs> we don't want our plants covered with that. Um, so we don't recommend that you buy so much from Home Depot or places like that. Not, not trying to name names per se, but uh, just as an example, because they tend to not be quite as aware of some of these considerations. So it's better to go to a, a reputable place. And if you're interested, if you're in our area and um, want to bring nature to your garden and need some advice, we have a conservation at home program uh, where we will consult with you about native plants, um, helping to make wildlife habitat, water conservation, um, that sort of thing. Next slide. So we, um, we recommend that you just start with what you have. Some people think, oh, you know, I can't, I don't, um, you know, I don't have much going on here, but that's okay. We say just start somewhere. Uh, do one section at a time, experiment. Gardening is always an experiment. Um, we make house calls, so we'll come, come to your garden and walk around and answer your questions and make suggestions. So let us know if you're in our in uh, one of the counties where we work or Cook County, where we have a partner with the Cook County Forest Preserve District. Um, if you'd like an on-site visit and we'll get you to the right person and you can join our conservation at home program. So do we have any questions from here? Yes, we do. All right. Um, so, Somebody wanted to know, do you have any tips for dealing with rabbits and groundhogs? I would say fencing. <laughs> yeah, it, definitely. It, yeah, we, we have, there's a, something I sprinkled on the ground to keep the rabbits away, but the minute it rains, it washes away. But like, like Nancy said, I have little, I put little cages around some of my plants to keep the, you know, the, the rabbits from eating it. And it, that seems to work, but you got, I keep it on until they're well established. They've eaten stuff of mine to the ground. And any of this, I've heard trying to use like Tabasco pepper spray on that doesn't seem to work for me either. So I don't know. Not much I know luck. there's, there's a product that's a like synthetic coyote urine that you can put around there. But like Jan says, you have to reapply it anytime it rains. Um, but I also want to note that it's hard to say that a particular plant is or is not rabbit or deer proof. Rabbits especially seem to have regional preferences. Everybody laughs at me when I say this, but I have had people in one place tell me, oh, rabbits never bother my whatever. And I go the next town over and the rabbits have just eaten all of that same plant to the ground. So I swear they have regional preferences. And to that, what you said, because the other day, one of our volunteers was stopped by when I was out working uh, Chuck and he said oh he goes I was saying we needed columbine and ours is growing and he said oh I have tons of it it reseeds I have tons of it. I go well my problem is the rabbits ate all mine I literally I have nothing left I keep eating it and again here the, the rabbits do not touch the butterfly weed they I'll ate my butterfly my weed and they ate it to the ground in my yard I have one yeah. persnickety little rabbit <laughs> yeah and I'd like to add that um you wouldn't think that rabbits would be eating butterfly weed, uh, weed which is a milkweed, um, because generally speaking, milkweed is not palatable. But um, I have I have read that the plants, when they're young, haven't started putting out those chemicals that make them uh, yeah. palatable. So they get, they will 
eat them when they're small, but not when they're larger. So you may just have to fence for a little bit until the plant gets big enough that- um, I think that goes for a lot of plants. Cause I, I've heard yeah. that too, when the plants are really young and tender, the rabbits are more likely to go after them. Yeah. And in subsequent years when they've had more time to develop. And the other thing is that, that rabbits do not like plants in the mint family. So that goes to Robin made the comment that peppermint oil spray works well for rabbits. Oh. I've never tried it, but it sounds I'm like it might make work. a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> may, may try that the next time. So we'll see. And then Jill said too, it seems if I plant either wild onion or mountain mint near plants, they like it or, or near plants they like, it keeps them from bothering it, even liatris. Hmm. Okay. So there you go. Wild onion, mountain mint, all these kind of nice, very fragrant, smelly kinds of things. So um, and then Donna asked, if I spray my plants with liquid fence, which is kind of that coyote urine substitute I mentioned, um, or plant skid, which I'm not familiar with, does it harm the insects? My gut reaction would be no, um, because it's not intended as an insecticide. It's just intended as a smell that they don't like. So I'm not familiar with plant skid, plant skide. I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I'd have to look that one up, but I know liquid fence is, is just an odor. So it does, it actually doesn't harm the insects at all. Yeah. And it probably washes off. So it's not going to be a long-term. Yeah. yeah I know the liquid. Yeah. Fence I think does. it's mostly about getting the plants bigger. <laughs> um, Jim wants to know, do the cultivars have the same deep root system as the natives? Do you want do you want to take that, Nancy? You want me to? I guess I don't know for sure. I, I but I would guess that they that they probably do. Um, that that would be. I have not researched that either. It's a good question, but I would guess that too. Usually, they the cultivars are usually like Nancy's show, where the aster has the wide habit versus the narrow, and some of it's the flower size or flower color. So I don't know that it would affect the roots so much, but it mainly it's the with the habit habit that the plant takes is what they're trying to change. Right, and and that's. There is a concern when we talk about cultivars because occasionally the flower, which is, is going to be one of the big benefits to the insects, the flower gets changed in such a way that the insects either no longer recognize it, it blooms at a wrong time when they're not looking for it, um, or the flower itself has just been changed so much that their mouth parts no longer fit, kind of like a lock and a key. If you change that lock too much, the key no longer fits. Yeah, so, double like double um, double flower heads. What, yeah, um, yeah, are those not as good. You know, they can't initiated. they can't find the nectar. Um, so so be careful. Straight species is always best if you can find it. Um, you know, sometimes, especially if it's a gar uh, plant for your home garden, you're just going for a certain look, and you don't mind if it's maybe not as beneficial as something else. You got to love your yard at the end of the day. So um, plant for the pollinators, but also keep in mind, you're also planting for you and your neighbors as well. All right, um, Donna wants to know if you happen to get plants with neonics, does it just last for the one year or always? Hmm. I don't know the so answer to that. What I have heard is it, it will persist a little bit because it will be in the roots. Um, it's not a permanent thing, but I don't know that anybody really knows for sure how long it persists. If you know for sure that your plants have been treated with something, one of the recommendations is to basically cut it to the ground and, and let it re-sprout, but it may take another year or two before it gets all of that sort of out of its system. That's what I've read. That kind of makes sense. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not coming at it from an academic source. Um, it's secondhand information. So just that caveat, um, that's my understanding of things. Um, Kathy wants to know, what do you think about rototilling? We touched on it a little bit earlier, but if you maybe wanted to repeat that for anybody who came in late. So uh, I'll go ahead and answer. So yeah, we mentioned that, you know, we had um, pulled up the filter fabric and what we, you can plant, if the grass is dead, you can plant through it. And the reason we don't recommend tilling a couple of things, um, there's all that organic matter. And when you start disturbing it, it disturbs the good stuff that's already there, but also it really opens up your garden to weeds. 
I mean, I, I had a small area that, you know, we had turned over and all the weeds came right to the area that all that fresh dirt is there that allows these seeds to come in. Um, when we had our, when we did our, pulled up the, uh, can't think, the cardboard and we pulled up the filter fabric, you know, we had piles of dirt and there was like tiny little seedlings all over the piles of dirt that we had left there. And they just, they just invaded everything we had. So that's why we don't recommend tilling, you know, the gardens. It sort of ruins the organic matter, the mass that's already built. But it also, you know, it invites weeds. Yeah, just to add to that, um, there's more and more information coming out about the, um, the importance of the uh, fungi that live in the soil mm -hmm. and that they actually help. They live in a symbiotic relationship with the plant roots and such. And so when you're rototilling, you're disrupting that, all that that's going on. So the, the less you can disturb the soil, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. I, I was brought in a little bit late on a project recently and the people who were preparing the area for the bed had already gone through and rototilled everything. And I was like, Ugh, because we couldn't get the plants in for another few weeks. And by the time we did get the plants in, it was all covered with weeds again. And so we had to go through and just pull everything by hand again. And it took us probably twice as long to plant as it would have if they had just put something down over the top to kill everything. So, um, and Louise wants to know then, what about aerating? Is that similar? It, it, it's totally different because basically your grass is a, a, a dead zone. I mean, not, you know, there, there wasn't much habitat for animals there. So um, aerating actually, you're, it's good for compacted soils. Um, and actually what you do is you, you know, you aerate it, you put a light layering of topsoil and you can reseed over the top of it. So that's grass versus planting beds we're talking about. And that's totally different. Whereas I said, you know, we're, we always encourage people to plant less grass and remove uh, and put more planting beds in just because your grass is not providing any nutrition for any of the, the, the wildlife or the wildlife, the birds, bees, butterflies. Um, in our yard, I've actually, I've, my son's friend comes over and he laughs. He goes, every time I come to your yard, you have less and less grass. And, and we just did a whole project and my husband's a landscape architect and so am I, that's our background. We always have to compromise. But literally there was a strip of grass and every time there was a strip, I go, I don't wanna mow that. So we just put it, I, we mulched it or we, we you know, covered it up, killed, killed the grass and we replanted it. This past spring, we planted over a hundred native plants back in our backyard. It looks totally different just because we had spruce trees dying, but we got rid of all that grass. And now I have so much, and once, you know, it's taken me, we've been in this house 26 years. And when we first moved in, there was a berm and it was all grass. I mowed it once and I said, I never want to do that again. So we stripped all the soil off and I've been growing it. And as uh, Nancy was mentioning, we, my, like I said, my husband's a landscape architect. So we have to compromise. We have some ornamental. We started off with, you know, a lot of ornamental actually, because I didn't know better and about the importance of natives. And I started interplanting natives. So we have a whole mixture in our yard. And um, I tell you, the natives is what I, like I have daylilies. I don't see any butterflies coming to them, none whatsoever. And the, my native plants, my, and what I love about my, um, the, Nancy mentioned, keep the seed heads. When our office was downstairs, I had finches on it every day eating all the seed heads off. And then I had uh, hummingbirds coming to my flowers. It was just amazing all the stuff I had coming uh, over, the, over the year watching it since I was home watching it. But the, the, the finches particularly love the purple cone flower and my black eyed Susan, the, cone, the heads of it. Yeah, and you make a really interesting point, Jan. One of the best ways to start with natives is to just sw start swapping things out. So maybe take out a patch of daylilies and swap them out with some black-eyed Susans. Yeah. There you go. Now you've got native plants in your yard. You've already got a place to start. Um, swap out those hostas. You know, much like grass, hostas are fairly biologically inert too. They don't do anything. Nothing really eats them. They don't feed anybody. So swap out some of those hostas and put something else in, you know, maybe some cone flowers, maybe just some grasses, you know, some nice native drop seed or side oats grandma or something like that. And now you're all, you, you've got a place to start already. So um, very, very easy ways to start in your yard just by, you know, swap out those knockout roses for an Illinois rose or whatever happens to be native in your particular area. And, and that's, you know, that's a good point. Cause I had, we had a lot of periwinkle, you know, vinca in a lot of areas and it was like everywhere. So I started ripping it out. My husband's like, you want to keep, I go, no. So I've been ripping it out in our shade areas. I now have, 
um, the wild ginger just growing up and it's massing everywhere. It's covering everywhere. In some of the shady sort of shady areas, I have the wild geranium and I have also the wild petunia. Um, and I will find wild petunia in my grass, but that's okay. I don't care. I just mow it over and it stays low. But I've been swapping out and I have like one little patch I sort of contain, but you know, it starts to spread and I keep cutting it back. So, and if I, you know, like the whole area we just did back here, I got rid of all of it. I mean, I have none left back there, which is awesome. But every so often, it's pretty hardy. I mean, I buried this thing under three feet of dirt and it came up through it. It's like, oh my gosh. So it's a hardy. I'm going to have you over to give me suggestions on my yard too. Yes. My yard's in a constant state of flux and experimentation <laughs> and oy, I got all kinds of stuff going on in my yard. So, um, all right. I don't, let's see, that, yeah, maybe one more. Oh, Jill wants to know, is there anything that'll outcompete <laughs> Creeping Charlie? No. Uh, oh God. <laughs> no. My neighbor has it in his yard and I'm always ripping it out, trying to keep it from coming in my yard. And yeah, it's, uh, the creeping Charlie is very hard to get rid of. I, I, I don't know of anything that can really outcompete that. Um, and that's, I, I actually, I actually have vinca on that side of my yard, and creeping Charlie is overtaking the vinca. It's a it's a war between the two on that edge. But you know, the, the creeping Charlie is very invasive. Yeah, if it gets into your lawn, you really just have to <laughs> kill it. Um, uh, yeah, I, have, I mean, have pretty good luck getting it out of my flower beds, but by digging out a hunk and like shaking the soil out, beating the soil out and making sure I got all the little roots out. And so that was pretty effective, but it's very time consuming. So Vinca, um, what's, what's the, the May's birth flower, Lily of the Valley, um, like all of those are, they're, they're all really, really the invasive. Euonymus, Euonymus Nasty. can be really hard to get rid of. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and that's not even considering, you know, the honeysuckle and the buckthorn and the stuff that you don't plant that just shows up. Thank you, birds. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really tough. You got to do your best to get rid of all the roots and field bindweed. Oh my gosh, the field bindweed yeah, is, that's, yeah. is terrible. Um, good luck. That's about all. Best I can say on that is good luck. So yeah, and if you live in our area, we'd be happy to do a yard visit you know, yes, help you exactly. Out. And if you are in our area and you are interested in a yard visit, my email is the one that you're getting all these Zoom notifications about. You'll get a follow-up email. Just reply and ask me your question. Let me know if you're outside of our area, feel free to email me with any questions you might have. Um, if you're, if you're in our area and you would like um, a yard visit or some, send me an email if I'm not the right person to talk to, if you're not in Will County, uh, I will get you to the right person. So with that. There um, was one last question. Are there any loose stripes that are okay? I'm, I'm not really aware of a native one. There was one, or if not, it was something similar, but don't quote me on that. I'm, I, can't, I can't think of it off the top of my head. If you're looking for something in your garden, obedient plant likes it a little wetter and has maybe a similar flower head. Yeah, if you look yeah, at you uh, rain gardens, if, if, you, if you're looking for something to put in a wetter area, um, look up rain gardens and, and look for plant lists that you can find in rain gardens because there's a lot of great suggestions on there. Um, ours is, we have a rain garden guide that is on our website that I think will also be in the page you'll be taken to at the end of this. And so you can look there as well for that. Um, but if that's all we got, I think that's all we got. I think we will go ahead and end now. So thank you so much, ladies. Thank, thank it's you. It's always a pleasure to chat plans with you guys. And Thanks. thank you all yes, for tonight. attending. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. We hope to see you all back again in October for our surprise webinar. Um, Stay tuned, follow our Facebook page, check out our website. We'll have the information up there shortly. And probably next spring, we'll probably do a follow-up on, hey, what's coming up and what it looks like. We're gonna, this is a continuing series we're going to keep following. So next year, you'll see how much things have grown up next year. So keep following us. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll so be exciting to see. Stay tuned, everybody. Bye-bye. Have Take a good care. night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.